evening. Good evening, Pastor Denise and Webster. God bless you too for joining in tonight. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but I'm excited about the Word of God. The Word does change our lives. It empowers us. It strengthens us and encourages us to keep holding on to God's unchanging hand. Hallelujah. Amen. I don't know about you, but these lessons have been truly enriching to my spirit, help changing my life every day to become more and more like Christ Jesus. Many times when you prepare to study God's word, you get many distractions and the enemy brings many different things in your life to attack you. Yesterday and today I had a major spasm in my back and it just really was bothering me. But nevertheless, I took some muscle relaxers and God gave me instruction to keep moving forward anyway and watch the healing take place. It happens when you just keep on focusing on what God wants you to do in spite of distractions, in spite of the things the enemy brings against you. It can't stop what God is doing in your life because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. So the word says where there's two or three gathered in his name, he's in the midst of so we're going to go ahead and get started. We're going to open up in a prayer, and then we get into our lesson. So gracious God, our Father, Lord, we honor to come into your presence once again. We thank you for the victory in Christ Jesus over depression, anxiety, sickness, disease, body aches, discouraging moments, oh God. Every attack of the enemy that comes against us to bring us to a place of doubting your ability to heal and deliver we ask today, God, that you remove the business of the day, allow our minds to focus on you, that you will be glorified. Feed us like a shepherd feeds his flock. Let your anointing flow, Father God, to heal right now, Father, those who are dealing with pain and dealing with um, discomfort in their bodies, God, and ailments, whatever it is, God. It's in the name of Jesus that we are healed by the stripes of Jesus Christ. We thank you for it, God, we claim it by faith. In Jesus' name, anoint this lesson, Lord, that it be inspiring, edifying, building us up in our faith to study the word, to meditate on the word, to feed on the word every day, that we can grow in grace and in the knowledge of who you are. And I thank you for every person that comes with tonight to God, those and those who may come hear this word later on, Father God, that will minister to their souls, oh God, and bring them to an understanding and clarity concerning offense that we allow in our hearts through ourselves or through other people, God, that you would heal and deliver and set us free. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. God bless you, Lashana. Thank you for joining tonight. Amen. Last week we talked about the cure from offenses and the six stages of spiritual heart disease. And we talked about those different components that affects a child of God's life when you're not careful and not aware of the tactics of the enemy, how he comes along as wolves in sheep clothing to deter, to distract, and discourage. To deter, to dis distract, and discourage you from walking in your purpose, from being healed, from being delivered. The heart conditions that people are dealing with, we neglect the signs that, that God warns us concerning the adversary of what's going on in our lives. And many times we get distracted because we're focused on everything else but what's going on in inside of our heart. Just like a natural person when they start having heart attacks, there's a warning sign. There's a sharp pain that it gets into your chest and it radiates down your left side of your arm because that's the closest to the heart, which lets you know that something is, is, is misaligned with the Spirit of God in your body and it's about to take you out. So when God gives us these warning signs, even when it comes to the spiritual heart, there are warning signs that, that shows you the indication that something is not aligned with God's word in your life and that you need to pay attention to it and get back in realignment with the spirit of God, allowing the spirit of God to begin to manifest himself in you to heal, deliver the brokenness and bring you out of the circumstance and conditions that you allow yourself to affect your spiritual heart. God promised Israel that he would take out the stony heart and give them a heart of flesh. He promised that he would take out that, that flesh of the world, that, the heart of the world, and give them a heart of his spirit. 
And that's what we want every day in our lives. And we should desire and want to have the heart of God that will help empower us to live in the fullness of how we were created for God's glory to manifest himself in the earth. You are the closest Jesus that somebody going to see in this earth. And your story, your testimony, God has given you through the trials and the tests, things you've gone through, the things he brought you out of, is your story that you need to share with somebody else who is in a dying world on their way to hell. The word says we are the salt of the earth. If a salt loses savor, it is no good to be but to be cast out and thrown on the ground and trodden under the foot of men. So you are the pres preservation that God uses to save somebody from going to hell. But a lot of people don't know that because they don't study the word of God. They don't, they don't meditate. They don't pray. They don't spend time in God's presence. So they allow themselves to be distracted and distorted and be destroyed by the enemy in their minds because of unbelief. And it's very important to recognize when you're in a broken state of heart, that pride comes next because that pride would cause you to not seek out for help. It would cause you to get into a, a place in your mind where you feel like no one cares about you. No one's going to be able to help me get out of this predicament I put myself in. Some committing adultery can't get out of. Some foreign can't, can't get out of. Some in homosexuality can't get out of. Some just, and, uh, just wandering in all types of iniquity. And for this reason, God told uh, uh, Paul to write to, to the uh, church at Rome to, in, to let them know that when you get to the place where your vile affections take over, God lets you be turned into a reprobate mind. Where your wrong becomes right and right becomes wrong in your eyes because you've been stuck in a condition for so long to pride fills your heart with iniquity. Not only that, God wants to know that perfect love casts out fear. So when you're bound by pride, now, now fear comes in. Because now I'm not fearing God anymore. I'm, I'm fearing the things of the world. I'm fearing everything the enemy can bring against me, but I'm not willing to let go of myself and return to the Lord that God can save and deliver me. So it's very important as a child of God to let go of a fearful heart, a broken heart, a fearful heart, because that fearful heart will keep you paralyzed, keep you crippled. I remember as a child, my mother used to make me take the trash out late at night sometime, and it'd be dark outside. I was afraid to go outside in the dark. I was afraid to go outside because I felt like somebody's going to get me or something's going to happen to me. And that's because of the enemy from watching so many horror movies and, and stuff that's not of God. It caused and it built in my heart a formality of fear. So anything that I didn't understand, I feared it. I feared interviews. I hated going to interviews for a job because I feared I, I wasn't going to say the right things to get the job. And that's one thing God wants to know, that fear will hinder you from your progression. Fear will hinder you from walking in your purpose that God has for you. You got to recognize the signs and the wonders that the enemy is trying to use to paralyze you by fear. Perfect love casts out fear. God is not giving the spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. So if you allow the spirit of God to radiate your mindset, to cleanse your mindset, to purify your mindset, he fills you with truth and righteousness. Excuse the glitches tonight. I don't know why it's doing that. But one thing about it, when you go back to play this video again on YouTube, it plays correctly. It doesn't have any glitches in it. I check it all the time. It may glitch right now, but it will clear up on YouTube. But I want to encourage you, don't allow yourself to be filled with fear. Fear will cause you to be in a displacement of your purpose. It'll make you get blinded from seeing what God is doing in your life to perfect you. All you focus on and all the negative things about yourself. I don't like the way I look. I don't like the way I feel. I don't like the way people treat me. I don't like the way people talk to me. I don't like why, why this, why that. It's like every time I turn around, something wrong happening. Why? Because I'm feeding on fear. So I'm, a mag I'm like a magnet to problems. When you bound in fear, you become a magnet to problems. So you attract all the negative things the enemy has to offer you into your life. And it goes into your mindset. Then you get an angry heart. We talked about that. Angry heart. Be full of brokenness. And you, you, you turn away from God because you're so angry. Because it seems like God is not answering your prayers. How many times have you been in, in a position where well, you seem like you prayed and you prayed, you cried and you cried, and it doesn't seem like God answered you. It seems like God just turned the deaf ear to you. 
I want to let you know God does hear you. He knows every cry before you utter from your mouth. He knows your tears before they fall from your eyes. God knows everything about you because he created you for his glory. And if God created you, then it's a guarantee. He knows everything about you that's hurting you. So don't allow anger. Anger rests in the bosom of fools. The word says don't be hasty to get angry because anger rests in the bosom of fools. So if I'm hasty, that means I'm, I'm just quick to get hostile. I'm quick to get into a bitter attitude. I'm quick to get re to place retaliation. So when I get that type of mindset through anger, the Bible said, don't let the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither be angry. Why? Because if I allow anger to fester, it causes my behavior to change, to become more negative and violent. You ever been around people who are always angry, always hostile, always argumental, always aggressive? They're angry. They're ready to fight anyone that opposes them. Even will provoke you to fight them. But when you know that you've been born again by the spirit of the living God, you recognize the signs of the enemy in that individual. And the best response you can do to a person like that is God bless you and walk away. They're going to nitpick at you. They're going to pump and prime at you. They're going to try to force you to get out of your character. One thing we teach a lot in our church is about character and integrity. Your character is who you are. Your integrity is your, your honesty and obedience to the Lord. So the more I stand in my character, I'm not going to come down to your level. I'm not going to let you pull me down out of my character to act unseemly the way God doesn't want me to act. So I'm going to maintain my righteous stand. Even when I'm angry, you never know it. I'm the type of person, I've been this way ever since I was a teenager. I can be so full of anger. No, I never knew it because I always put a smile on my face. Inwardly, I was furious when things happened to me. I was furious of rejection. I was furious of the pains that people caused on my life. But God had to teach me to take that same negative energy and praise him. Begin to decree and declare the changes that I want to see in my life and become. And the more you listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit, your life changes. It becomes more fruitful, becomes more abundant, becomes filled with the righteousness of God. Your attitude changes. The anger, anger in your heart begins to melt away because of the word of God. A person who's full of anger hates themselves. They hate themselves. So anything that comes against them makes them upset. A hopeless heart. A hopeless heart is what we talked about last week as well. When you walk through life over, overcompensating out for our brokenness and serving our fears every day, we get exhausted. You can only be angry for so long until it hit an exhausted stage. A hopeless heart makes you weary. A hopeless heart exalts you, makes you, makes you tired. It pulls your energy. It pulls your strength and it makes you get to a place in a slump when you get down in the pit of despair and you can't seem to get out of it. And God wants you to know tonight that there is a remedy to rise above this. God bless you, my brother Gary. God bless you. God wants you to rise above a hopeless heart. Jeremiah said, this one thing I recall to mind, that there is hope in the Lord that his mercies are new every morning, his compassion <coughs> does not fail. Great is thy faithfulness. When you recognize that you find yourself through sickness, infirmities, disappointments, discouragements, pain, starting to drift off in another direction, that's not of God. You need to rebuke that spirit because that's the enemy. Because when a strong man is at rest, his goods are at rest until a stronger than he comes. Our strong man that overcomes the strong man in our life called pride and, and arrogance and haughtiness is Jesus Christ. When he comes in and he sits on the throne of your heart, he overpowers and he strips 
the strong man in your life that's preventing you from walking in your promise. And he takes away his power and spoils his goods. And he sets you free on the inside out. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. That means delayed. When I have delayed hope, I'm really not trusting God. I'm looking at my condition. I'm focusing on my sickness. But when I recognize that I can change my focus, don't allow myself to get hopeless, I can stand on God's word. Then number five, a hard heart. That's that heart that's callous. That heart that's rooted and grounded in rebellion. You ever know somebody in your life that just just straight up rebellious, no matter what you try to teach them, no matter what you tell them, they just will not be in. They just stubborn. And they just gets on your last nerve. No matter what you do to try to change them, they refuse to change. Because they've been rooted so long in that negative foul spirit to when God trying to break it, it's hard to get through to them because they don't want to change. You got children like that. You got adults like that. They grew up in religion and they're so religious, they know earthly good. Until God has to come along with his jackhammer of the spirit. You seen those construction workers working in the street? When they get ready to break up the street to, to repair the pipes on the ground, they take a jackhammer. They have a small jackhammer and they have a machine jackhammer that's large. And it pounds that ground till it breaks. God does the same thing to the Holy Spirit. He takes the jackhammer of the Spirit. He pounds at that callous heart. And he breaks it. And he breaks it in, into pieces. Until it crumbles. Then God comes in. And applies his love. His mercy. His compassion. To the hardened heart. And he changed their mindsets. The Holy Spirit takes divine work in our lives every day when a person is willing to say, okay, here I am. I can't do it no more, God. I try my way. Things ain't getting no better. The bill collector's ringing my phone. I lost my job. And no matter what I've done, God, I just created a bigger mess. So here I am to surrender. Here I am to give all to you, Jesus, that you come in and take control. And when he comes in, he comes in like a mighty rushing wind, and he drives away all of your enemies that have come against you. He delivers you. He sets you free. He opens the door opportunities. He shows you favor. He bless you beyond measure to where even your children and the children's children are blessed. All because of your willingness and your obedience. And the last one we talked about was numb or a checked out heart. Numb or a checked out heart. A numb or checked out heart has also become more common to that condition today. Although the previous heart conditions listed here are dangerous when unchecked, it is this stage is lethal. So when you become numb and you check out of your heart, that means you don't hear nothing, don't feel nothing. No matter what God preached to you through the gospel, you don't feel a thing. Because you got so callous, so stubborn, so hardened hearted to where you just numb to society. Anything that happens, it don't phase you because you don't even care no more. You got to the place you don't care if you live, you don't care if you die. And that's a dangerous, lethal place to be in to where you don't fear anything no more. Because you've been messed up for so long, all you expect is your life to continue to stay in the same cycle. You can minister a hundred tons of nuclear love from heaven, but will still get nothing. Because you got so stuck in your mindset, no matter what God brings to bring light to your darkness, it has no effect on you. And that's a dangerous place to be in the presence of God. If you feel that way, you, you're numb in the spirit, you need to recognize that's of the enemy. That's not of God. A numb culture is like walking dead. You've seen the TV show, The Walking Dead, or you heard about it. Dead men walking. They done died and they get back up. 
in a dead state. We die. The word says when Christ died, we died also with him. But then we rose again unto new life that's found in knowing him. So when he rose us up, raised us up from the dead, guess what? He gave us the God kind of life. And that life, it changes the inside and the outside. Because once God gets your heart, he can have your attention. If he can get your attention, he can have your focus. If he can have your focus, he can lead and guide and direct you. But the problem comes in when I become numb. I don't care about anything happening to me. So therefore, the same spirit, check this out. God showed me when parents have gotten to the place in themselves, they don't care about anything in life. Don't care if you lose your job, don't care if you lose your house, don't care if you lose, lose your cars, your possession. That same spirit transfer to your children. Your children get the same type of attitude. They begin to pattern their lives after what they mimic from the parents. You have to be careful of the danger you inflict upon your children by your attitude. If you're one of those type of adults that cuss all the time, every time somebody make you mad, you cussing, and you wonder why your children cussing, check yourself. The same spirit that's on you gets into those attached to you. So the whole family is affected by your attitude. And it starts from the head. If the head ain't right, the body ain't going to be right. So the thing we need to do is recognize that this is not of God. Allow the Spirit of God to come in and change our lives. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 19. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 19. It says, a brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city. And their contentions are like the bars of a castle. That means rage. Their anger is like the bars of a, of a, of a castle. It's like imprisonment. So a brother offended is hard to win back. So if I hurt somebody, some people you, you know in your life that you came across their pathway before, that when they're offended, they don't want to talk to you no more. They delete your phone number. They remove you from their Facebook page, take you from their Instagram page, from their Twitter page. They don't have nothing to do with you because they're offended. And it's hard to win them back than a strong city. A strong city that's fortified stands together. So if a city stands together and the enemy comes against it, it says it's easier to win that city like God when he did with Nineveh. When he told Jonah to preach the gospel of Nineveh and the whole city got saved. Why? Because of the whole city. When the king made the decree that we need to fast, put on sackcloth and ashes, seek the Lord, the whole city came in one accord and God saved the whole city. So it's easier to win the city than a brother offended. So our, our lesson tonight it says, an offended Christian is one who takes in life, but because of fear, cannot release it. An offended Christian, one who takes in life. So you're taking in life. You're breathing life. But because of fear, you can't release life in somebody else. We receive the life of Christ, but because I'm offended, I don't want to tell nobody else about Jesus, especially somebody that hurt me. I want to hold them to their fence. I want to hold them in, 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 in responsibility for how they hurt me. I want to judge them. And that is the enemy's mindset to make you feel that vengeance has to be taken in your hands. When God promises, he resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. When you humble yourself, God himself will exalt you. 10 years ago, after 20 years of marriage, my husband walked out because he was no longer happy. I was totally devastated. It has been a long time trying to get over the hurt, abandonment, and rejection his leaving caused. 
I asked God to help me to forgive him. I truly thought I had, but still, I still carried hurt in my heart I could not get over. It was very painful whenever I had to see him. After reading the bait of Satan, the Holy Spirit impressed me to speak to my ex-husband and asked him to forgive me for holding this offense. We talked for the first time in 10 years. I truly believe I was healed and set free. I thank God for freeing me from this yoke of bondage that enslaved me for so long. How many times have you been in that condition of heart? You had an offense, you held on to it for many years. Maybe an ex-husband, maybe an ex-wife, maybe an ex-spouse, ex-boyfriend, ex-girlfriend, a friend who you trust and depend on hurt you. And you held on to the offense for so long and the more God tried to help you, you held on to the hurt, the abandonment, and the pain. Come and let you know tonight, you can be free from that. But you got to want it. Just like this woman, after reading the bait, bait of Satan, the Holy Spirit began to speak to her, her about her ex-husband. And she asked, went to him and asked him to forgive her. You need to do that. If you got somebody in your life that has offended you, you need to go to that person and make things right if you're a child of God. If you are truly a child of God, you need to go to the individual that offended you and ask them to forgive you and allow the Spirit of God to come into your heart to make things right between you and the individual. Until you recognize the root cause of an offense in your life, it's going to continue to have you hold on to the hurt of the past. The pains of the past, the scars of the past, the rejection of the past, the thing that people afflict you that hurt you the most. But God is saying tonight, you need to be the bigger person and ask God to forgive you and go after the individual to forgive you for holding on to an offense. I guarantee when you walk in obedience, guess what happens? The bars of iron, like a castle that's in prison, it breaks down. God disintegrates the bars that hold you in prison and he sets you free. God has the power. He has the ability to go beyond your limitations and he has the, the power and the way to fix things in your life that's broken and make the crooked places straight and the rough places smooth. That's the God we serve. He's able to do that. Matthew chapter 24, verse 10 through 13. Matthew chapter 24, verse 10 through 13. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Okay. In the King James, in the King James, it says, and then many will be offended, will betray one another, will hate one another. Then many false prophets will, will rise up and deceive many and because of lawlessness will abound the love of many will grow cold but he who endures till the end hallelujah shall be saved the amplified puts it this way the amplified version so at that time many would be be offended and repelled by the association with me. This is what Christ talking about. Talking about himself. That many are going to reject him. And will fall away from the one whom they should trust. And will betray one another. Handing, handing over believers to their persecutors. And that's something. Because you're fitting to Christ, you're going to betray one another. Handing over believers to their persecutors and will hate one another. Many false prophets will appear and mislead many. Because lawlessness is increased, the love of most people will grow cold. But the one who endures and bears up under suffering, I'm going to read that again, but the one who endures and bears up under suffering, that means endure, Keep standing. Keep building yourself up. To the end, we'll be saved. 
That's a promise. That's a covenant. This good news of the kingdom, the gospel, will be preached throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end of the age will come. That's a promise. That's a covenant. Verse 14. The gospel, it will be preached to every person before Christ comes again. But it's up to you to recognize the Spirit of God in your life and walk in truth and righteousness no matter what comes your way. Having done all the stand, keep standing and putting on your garment of warfare for warfare every day, your clothes that God has given us through Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through the latter part of that chapter. Put on your full armor because the more you clothe yourself ready for battle, Jesus Christ leads you in the victory. He will not abandon you. He will not forsake you, but he will lead you into victory. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Then it goes and say in this chapter of Matthew, Jesus is given the signs of the end of the age. His, his disciples asked, what would be the sign of your coming? Most agree we are in the season of his return. It is useless to try to pinpoint the exact day of his return. Only the Father knows that. But Jesus said we would know the season, and it is now. So can you agree tonight that we're in the season of the coming of the Lord? We're in the season. All the different things are happening around the world, the floods, the fires, the persecution, the mass shootings, all this stuff, the plagues, you had had uh, this COVID virus, then you had the Omicron, now you got monkeypox. All these things are in the season of his return. And it's, it's letting us know that we need to wake up as a church, get ourselves back in, in position, because the king is soon to come. But Jesus said we would know the season and it is now. Never before have we seen such prophetic fulfillment in the church, in Israel, and in nature. So we can confidently say that we are in, in the time period where Jesus described in Matthew 24, chapter. Notice one of the signs of his pending return. Many will be offended. Not few, not some, but many. Look at the news. People are offended. The reason why they're killing one another. People are offended when they're abusing children. People are offended over this and over that because they have lost their love for Jesus Christ. First, we must ask, who are these offended ones? Are they Christians or just society in general? We find the answer as we continue to read. And because of lawlessness will abound, lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. The Greek word for love in this verse is agape. There are several Greek words for love in the New Testament, but two most common are agape and phileo. Phileo defines a love found among friends. It is an affectionate love that is conditional. Phileo says, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Or if you treat me kindly, I'll do the same for you. The other hand, agape is a love of God shared abroad in our hearts in the hearts of the children. It's the same love Jesus freely gives to us. It is unconditional. It is not based on performance or even whether it is returned. It is a love that gives even when rejected. That is so awesome. So even though people offend me, even though people scandalize my name, mistreat me, I'm still going to be an outward expression of the agape. I'm going to continue to spread the good news of the gospel and the love of Jesus Christ that God poured towards my life when I was a sinner lost in, in sin and iniquity. He saved my life because of his own love. So that same love is a love I don't mind demonstrating. I don't mind letting others know that, hey, even though I might be hurt from what things you've done and what you said to me, forgive me. 
If I've done anything to hurt you, forgive me. Because many people you'll find out, they're not going to apologize. They mistreat you. They talk about you. They gossip about you. They lie on you. All the stuff they do, they're not going to apologize for it because of lawlessness that has filled their hearts. They have turned away from God. They don't care who they mistreat. They don't care about who they talk about. But the love of God, it constrains us to keep on sharing the good news of the gospel. Even though I want to retaliate, I want to get even with the individuals, I want to give them peace of my mind, the Spirit says, pray for your enemies and pray for those who despise and misuse you, say all men are evil against you falsely for my name's sake. For so persecute the prophets who went before you. It is very important as a child of God to walk in the truth of God's word. Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17, verse 3 and 4. It says, Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. Verse 4. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and in seven times a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. So if a person offended you and they hurt you and they come back and say, forgive me, Jesus says, you need to have his attitude. His attitude of love still forgives. They rejected him. They despised him. They hated him. They beat him. They hung him on a rugged cross. All the stuff they did, put a crown of thorns on his head, pierced him in his side. Yet he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That same love is the love that we have to demonstrate towards the people who seem to be unlovable in our lives. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2 and 3. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2 and 3. With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering. But bearing one another in love. Verse 3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. All this goes about love. Keep on allowing the love of God to be a channel that flows through your life, regardless of your emotions, regardless of your feelings. Because the love of God overpowers the voice of the enemy in your head. Because the enemy speaks in your head before it gets in your heart. When he gets in your head, he gets in your heart. Then he takes control of your life. But if you shut him down in your mind, shut out your ear gate from hearing the voice of the enemy, the Spirit of God begins to cover you, protect you, shield you, and keep you secure in his presence that the love of God still flows out of you. He said, guard your heart for out of it flows the issue of life. What's the issue of life? The love of God. Your issue of life, circumstances you're dealing with, people you're dealing with, you still have to allow that love to be the channel that flows out of your heart. Without God, we can only love with a selfish love. One that cannot be given if it is not received and returned. However, agape loves regardless of the response. Agape loves regardless of when people receive it or they reject it, it continues to love anyway. You got to get in yourself an attitude. So no matter what people say to me, no matter what they do to me, I'm going to keep on loving. Because the more I love my enemy, vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay. God promises that no weapon Formed against you, against me, it will prosper. And every tongue that rise against you, he said, in judgment you shall condemn. Because in the end time, when Christ takes his bride to glory, guess what? We're going to judge the world. He said, the saints are going to judge the world. We're going to judge the world of their iniquity, of their sinfulness, of their lawlessness, of their wickedness. We're going to be the ones sitting as judged to judge them of their actions. And God said he will render to every man according to the fruit of his doings. The God babe is the love Jesus shed when he forgave us on the cross. 
So the many Jesus refers to are Christians whose agape has grown cold. Isn't that something? Jesus, when he quote this word, was talking about the body of Christ. Those who claim that Jesus is Lord and Savior, claim they feel the Holy Ghost, baptized and that with fire, are the ones who are easily offended. And because of the offense, they find themselves shutting out the voice of God. And God is saying tonight, pay attention to the signs. Pay attention to the voice of the enemy. And know when it's God speaking and when it's yourself and when it's the enemy. Because sometimes we get ourselves in the way. Because the Holy Spirit is giving you instructions. He's speaking to your heart and telling you what to do, how to deal with an offense. But because of the attitude, we shut out his voice. Then we blame the devil. Stop blaming the devil for something that you cause yourself. We do this all the time. Oh, the devil made me do it. So you go in the store and someone at the cashier talks to you wrong, you retaliate, oh, the devil made me do it. Or you go in the store and you steal something you know you shouldn't have stole, and you tell you say the devil made me do it. I remember Flip Wilson, an old TV show, Flip Wilson, back in the 70s and 80s, used to always talk about the devil made me do it. How many times have we done that? We blame the devil for something I caused on myself. If I eat too much, the Bible says I'm a glutton. But the devil made me do it. I got sick from eating too much. I started throwing up. I started having illness in my body. Why? Because the devil made me do it. The devil didn't make you do it. It was your desire of your flesh that made you do it. All this in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And when your lust of the eyes sees something that you want, you overindulge in it. It doesn't matter what it is that your desire wants. If you eat too much of the world that it has to offer to you, you make yourself spiritually sick. And God is saying tonight, wake up, children of God. Pay attention to the signs and the wonders that we cause ourselves to be afflicted by. And stop blaming the devil. Just like if I eat too much candy, I'll also I get a cavity, get a hole in my teeth. Oh, the devil made me do it. God says, no, it didn't. It was your desire for eating too much sugar. Sugar caused de decay. Sin caused decay. The more I indulge in sin, sin caused decay. So I started spiritually falling away. I started getting physically, physically ill in my spiritual life, and my life began to depreciate the spirit of God's desire so I'm to be sucked out of me. Stop letting the enemy use people in your life to be a vacuum to suck out your life. We allow people in our circle who don't need to be in our circle. We allow them in our circle who we know has a hidden motive, who we know has an intention of my demise, who we know has a purpose to assassinate me. But I keep them in my circle anyway, knowing they ain't no good. Jesus knew Judas was no good. But guess what? Judas was on assignment. God knew Judas had an assignment, and that was to to betray him, to be crucified, so the will of God be done. If a person in your life who becomes your Judas, if God tells you to be in your circle, let him in your circle. If God says reject them, reject them. Stop holding the people God trying to pull out of your life that has no meaning to be in your life. Because some people want to bleed your anointing. They want to drain your life out of you because they're not reading and studying and praying for themselves. So I want everything you got that God gave you because I'm not going to do it myself. So when you get drained, you get tired, you get weary, you get frustrated, who are you going to run to? You can't go to them. So God says, beware, be on guard, that your love will not grow cold. There was a time when I didn't, when I did everything I could do to show my love to certain people. There was a time when I did everything I could show my love to certain people. But it seemed that every time I reached out to love, the person slapped me back with criticism and harsh treatment. I'm sure we all been through that before. The more you try to love certain people, the more they hurt you. The more they slap you. The more they scandalize you. The more they persecute you. This went on for months. One day I was fed up. I complained to God. I have, I have had it. I have had it. 
Now you're going to have to walk. Let me read this again. So I've complained to God. I've had it. In other words, I, I had enough. You're going to have to talk to me about this. Every time I show your love to this person, the anger thrown back in my face, this anger thrown back in my face, the Lord began to speak to me. John, you need to develop a faith in the love of God. That's something. That's a key point right there. Develop faith in the love of God. It says, what do you mean? I asked. He who sows to his flesh, will of the flesh reap corruption? He explained, but he who sows to the spirit, will of the spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season, we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Galatians chapter 6, verse 8 and verse 9. Galatians chapter 6, verse 8 and verse 9. You need to realize that when you sow the love of God, you will reap the love of God. You need to develop faith in the spiritual law, even though you may not harvest it from the field which you sowed or as quickly as you would like. The Lord continue, in my gr greatest hours of need, my closest friend deserted me. Judas betrayed me. Peter denied me and arrest for their lives, fled for their lives. Only John followed me from from afar. I cared for them for over three years, feeding them and teaching them. Yet as I died for the sins of the world, I forgave. I released them all my, from my friends who had deserted me to the Roman gods who had crucified me. They didn't ask for forgiveness, yet I freely gave it. I had faith in the Father's love. So do you got faith in the Father's love tonight? That when people desert you, persecute you, crucify you, slander you, abandon you? Do you have the God kind of faith that I'm going to continue to hold on to God's unchanging hand regardless of what's going on in my life? As Jesus demonstrated the greatest love ever, when Peter denied him, Judas betrayed him, the rest of the disciples hid from him, only John, John the beloved, was the only one that continued to follow after Jesus, even after his death on the cross. You have to have your own personal conviction. No matter what goes on in my life, I'm going to continue to keep holding on to God's unchanging hand. That's right, Pastor Terry. We must always be a representative of God's dress to kill with the full armor in Ephesians chapter 6. Then we are equipped to handle whatever life tosses us our way. Amen to that. Amen. That's awesome. Then he goes and says, I knew that because I had sown in love, I would reap love for many sons and daughters of the kingdom. Because of my sacrifice of love, they will love me. I said to I said to love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of the Father in heaven. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. He sends rain on the just and the unjust. That's his glory. God still reigns with glory. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet your brother only, what do you do more than others? Do not even tax collectors do, do also? Matthew chapter 5, verse 44 and 47 through 47. Matthew chapter 45, Matthew chapter 5, verse 44 through 47. So if you do love, demonstrate love to somebody with an expectance, and he then do the same thing, the word is saying, then what good is loving them? So what we have to do, whether people reciprocate, respond, or treat us the same way, I love them, we got to keep on loving them anyhow until the love of God breaks through that core of our hearts and sets them free. We're going to pick up on next week with the great expectations, the great expectations. So we're going to end right here in our lesson tonight. But I pray this is helping somebody because we are the vessels 
in the last days, in this season, that Christ is soon to come. And we are the ones that are supposed to be the outward expression of the agape, the love of God, regardless of what people receive it or reject it. You keep on doing what God called you to do, for great is your reward in heaven. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall be called the children of God. So if you're merciful to the unmerciful, God says you're called the child of God. You got to keep on letting God's love flow through your heart that you can walk, amen, that's right, Pastor Denise, walk in your victory. Walk and abide and live and camp out in your victory. And the more you walk in truth and righteousness, the enemy has no power, he has no influence, he has no mind control. He can't stop you from moving forward in the plan God has for your life. The purpose God has created you is a guarantee that God will continue to lavish you in his love. So Lord, tonight I thank you for this lesson. Thank you for every person that came on God. Pray that something has been said that will convict all of our hearts to change, to examine ourselves, to see where we are in our faith, oh God. If something on the inside of us should not be, God, that you take it out that you straighten us, perfect the thing that concerns us, that you will be glorified. And I thank you, Lord God, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Anyone have any questions tonight? Any questions concerning the lesson? Hallelujah. If you want to inbox me a question, you can go to Charles Emery on Facebook and um, send me an inbox your question, and I will answer your question. Amen. But again, I thank you for this word, God. I thank you that the hearers and ears, they hear what the Spirit says to the church. So, you all continue to be blessed. I want you to pray this prayer with me tonight. If someone on tonight, and you might be a backslider, you might be one that's uh, straight away from the faith, once walked with God, and something happened down the road, you slipped away. Someone who don't know Jesus, Lord and Savior, I want you to pray this simple prayer with me. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart. Forgive me for my sins, knowing and unknowingly, in the mighty name of Jesus. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Now come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. And I thank you for saving me. Now fill me with the Holy Spirit and power to be a witness for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. The Lord says the same. We will resume again next week, Tuesday at 7 o'clock hour. To continue in our lesson, dealing with offenses. I don't know about you, but it's easy to get offended when you're not walking in truth and righteousness. Many times we stumble, but one thing about God's love for us, we fall down, but it's a guarantee we get back up. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord turn his face towards you. May the Lord be gracious to you and give you peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Again, we thank everyone for coming on. Thank you, my son, for coming on tonight, too. And my brother, Gary, God bless you all and many others. God bless you. And you all stay encouraged, stay excited about Jesus, and know that God loves you, and so do I. Now walk in love and be the outward expression of God's love for mankind in this season. Have a good night.